All right. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Yasmina Sisarak, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Thank you for joining us for our 10th webinar in the COVID-19 webinar series presented by the Health Matters Program in the Department of Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois at, in Chicago. Um, through the continued partnership with Project Search and their funding from the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council and collaboration with Aspire Community Services in Illinois. For today's presentation, we are going to be uh, talking about even during a crisis, people with disabilities have rights, and we're delighted to have Sarah Ailey from Rush University. This presentation will provide an overview on the need to implement hospital visitation policies for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, best practices, policies that advocate for the rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to have a caregiver with them while hospitalized to help them make decisions and provide reassurance and calmness is a matter of life and death. Implementation of strategies that support healing for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities if, care, if caregivers cannot be present will also be discussed. Um, a little bit about our presenter, Sarah Ailey, is a professor uh, at, in the Department of Community Systems and Mental Health Nursing at Rush University at Chicago, Illinois. She is president of the Alliance for Disability and Healthcare Education. Her research and scholarly practice are concentrated on improving the lives of people with disabilities, in particular intellectual disabilities, by translating research into practice within community and inpatient hospital settings. Um, again, we are going to be recording this webinar. The PowerPoints and all the resources will be made available within about a week of the webinar. Um, we will have a question and answer section of the webinar um, after 45 minutes. Please ask all your questions in the chat box. And thank you again for joining us. Sarah, welcome. Okay. So as, as uh, Yasmina said, we'll be talking about hospitalizations for persons with intellectual disabilities. They need caregivers and they're not, these are not just visitors. So uh, objectives for this presentation, we'll talk about an overview of hospitalization visitation policies. Uh, we're gonna discuss best practice policies um, that advocate for the right of persons with an intellectual disabilities to have a caregiver that, with them while hospitalized and delineate strategies that support healing for people with intellectual disabilities if caregivers cannot be present in the hospital. So probably not telling you anything you don't know, but um, the infection rates for persons with intellectual disabilities are higher than the general population, and the death rates and complications are also higher. So they're more likely to end up in the hospital. So unfortunately, some of these things aren't new. I was looking at a uh, headline from the Boston Globe April 9th, 2020, so early on in the uh, crisis. And just like coronavirus, the 1918 flu pandemic ravaged group living facilities. Um, the, in Illinois, at last I looked, they're still not collecting um, information on infection rates in like group homes or smaller facilities. They are in the developmental centers, but, but otherwise no. But there is information from New York that the infection rates in these smaller facilities is also higher than the general population. And unfortunately, we're not tracking it. So what happens when hospitalized? And this is one, and I've seen multiple things on Facebook of this sort. Uh, this was in New Jersey, a man with Down syndrome died from coronavirus on his 30th birthday, a week after the mo his mother died and quarantine rules prevented the family from being with him. And there's, there are, I've seen this in a very post and so forth, of people being left alone to die. So as I'm probably again, uh, preaching to the choir, but many persons with intellectual disabilities have limited verbal skills, 
They would have difficulties understanding what's happening to them and any treatments. They already have trauma in unfamiliar settings. And if they've already been hospitalized in the past, they probably have trauma from previous hospitalizations. And they already have anxiety due to separation from their family and friends or staff. So the policies that limit and say they cannot have any visitor or no person with them under any circumstances, to me, is a basic violation of human rights. And it's also a violation of civil rights we just celebrated the 30th anniversary of the ADA Act over the weekend. It says directly, people with disabilities are entitled to reasonable accommodation. So not only it's a reasonable accommodation that we need it for, for, the, for the person, but if you don't have the person, a caregiver or the support person there, the, the medical, the, the, the the caregivers, the healthcare professionals may not have um, vital information that they need. And certainly trauma and anxiety uh, complicate care, make everything more difficult. Uh, I've certainly heard stories where um, people have been heavily sedated unnecessarily during COVID hospitalizations because they're so anxious. And that certainly doesn't help the respiratory status or any of that. So at best practice policies, I am at Rush University and we issued, it was either after April 2nd or 3rd, looking at my emails when it came out, a definite policy that said patients with disabilities who need assistance can have a designated support person with them, period. Um, and then it goes on to say this could include mental status, intellectual or cognitive disability, communication behave, or behavior concerns. If they require an accommodation that requires this, they can have it. So this came out uh, early April. The New York Department of Public Health also issued a statement April 9th saying that hospitals are required to permit a patient with support person at the bedside and one of the, the groups they listed was patients for whom a support person has been deemed to be essential, including persons with intellectual disabilities. So, I mean, these were the first couple that I know of that came out. I had, at that time, I was looking at uh, hospital websites and I couldn't find any others that specifically said that persons with intellectual disabilities and disabilities could have support persons. I did find one that said they could, but not if they had COVID. So, um, there was a campaign launched by the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, which began in early April. Um, they had a change.org position, petition up that by the time by June 9th had it over 47,000 signatures, uh, gained support from 57 or so organizations. And on June 9th, the Office of Civil Rights and the US Department of Health and Human Services issued a resolution and said federal law requires hospitals and state agencies overseeing them to modify the no visitor policy. Um, I still see things on Facebook and other social media that people are being denied visitors. Or being denied, a, I shouldn't say just a visitor, they're being de denied a support person. So, so I, in any case, if any people you're talking to, if they're saying they're being denied a support person, the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Health say that can't do that. Um, so I think you'd be interested, I thought, why, why was it, I, I think it, I'm at Rush, I was involved in writing the statement. Why were we, it, and it really was non-controversial, it took us about a day to get the statement up. Um, we've had an ADA task force since 1991. 
Uh, there's also been a committee to address needs during healthcare, particularly emergency department visits and hospitalizations since 2007 for persons with intellectual disability. There is a documentary on this work that came out May 1st, and I've given you the website for it, and certainly when you get the slides, it's there. You can go, go to uh, Vimeo, and it's called None of Us Want to Stand Still. So I think part of it was the culture at, at, the, at Rush was that we should just do this. It was, it was part of what we were already doing. And there was recognition that people needed support person. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. So if you're talking then about strategies for persons who end up in the hospital, COVID or not, uh, what are some important strategies to make this go well? And one is the use of what are called portable health records. Some circles are also called health resumes and not overly happy with the term health passports, but they're also called health passports. And these would be typically two to maybe three page documents that give basics, what, what are diagnoses, what is the chronic conditions, what medications people are on, is there a guardian, who is it, um, what are key things to know about them, uh, the person, are there things that may be upsetting, uh, frightening, what things may be calming, how do they, people communicate, so forth. So it's a very short document that people can that healthcare professionals can look at quickly and get basic information. And I, this, uh, for instance, is covered in our documentary and the, um, it was a person who's an emergency department physician said this became transformative when these were available, that rather having big binders of information, you could get what you needed by looking at two to three pages. And actually in the DC and Maryland area, Anyone getting services has to have this, and it needs to be updated yearly. Another important strategy is education for staff in healthcare institutions. Um, standards of care at Rush, we do have a, in the electronic medical record a nursing care plan. And there will say, then there is an educational module that goes along with it. We've also, in our hospital, the entire security department was trained on recognizing and interacting with persons with uh, autism and intellectual disabilities, and certainly proper charting. Um, I know from the looking at data that it's way under charted in, in the easily accessible parts of the chart, the, the presence of an intellectual or disability. So all those things will help it, the staff in healthcare institutions to, to better communicate with the persons and then to better communicate amongst each other in providing care. And these are all things that we have done at Rush. So, as I mentioned before, oh, this must be, anyways, oh, I've gone the wrong way again. Sorry. Here. The other thing, it's very important to build a culture of respect and inclusion. I would include in that very much so the partnering with the community. Um, the committees at Rush, they do have regular input from the committee, from the community. I like things like community advisory boards. It's important, I think, to hire people with disabilities. We do at Rush have programs to hire people with disabilities, including intellectual disabilities. I think that also makes healthcare professionals view persons with disabilities and intellectual disabilities as colleagues and not as the other. And certainly, you have to build a culture 
in healthcare institutions where uh, persons with disabilities are comfortable to self-identify. And that's been done, I think, not so much in healthcare, but certainly in other major corporations and so forth across the country. Uh, maybe briefer than I thought, but th these kinds of programs are better costs. Uh, there was a recent publication in the American Journal of Med Managed Care, and this looked at, uh, we know, of, I know of three sort of inpatient settings across the country that have tailored programs. One would be at Rush, Georgetown in Washington, D.C. was another, and um, Dignity Health in California. And this this particular, uh, in this publication, we looked at uh, Georgetown and Rush versus three match controls, and there were better cost outcomes where there were tailored programs. So we found that programs, hospitals without tailored programs had six for high, to higher costs, and those with for patients who what they call extreme admission severity of illness at 42% higher cost. I don't think that's the major issue, but in case. So those are the things I had to say. I really thought this would be mostly discussion. How, does, how can we get this to happen? So I, I didn't take up 45 minutes. Sure, Sarah, um, what are the next steps for Ed Rush? And um, um, feel free to ask any questions, um, um, and I will uh, um, ask of Sarah. So, uh, uh, next step, I, I have talked to, I, I actually haven't, I don't work on the inpatient side, and I've only been over there a couple of times since March 13th, but I've talked to students who are working on the units and they said, oh yeah, you know, there were, person was there who had intellectual disabilities and a family member was there with them. It, they, it happened. Uh, our, I, I actually would like to pull the data uh, on persons with intellectual disabilities hospitalized with COVID uh, to get that data, we're, to, we're now in July. I might be able to get March, April, May at this point. So it's probably a little early to see what the outcomes were. Uh, we do know there that uh, the, our general outcomes have been, uh, we I heard it, our general outcomes was we had a death rate similar to the country, but that we had a higher acuity rate in general, because we've taken in uh, patients from other institutions with COVID, partly because of the availability of ICU beds and ECMO and so forth. Um, next steps, we are working, I'm currently working with both uh, nursing and occupational therapy students, along with faculty member in occupational therapy, to work on improved documentation as people come in so that there's improved both improved communication to units if people come in through the emergency department up to the units and then also uh, this may lead to better reimbursement we're continuing I like we did a whole project with a security department what I got was that things improved for a while and you know, not as imp as improved as it was in the initial period. I'm sure, there's been turnover and so forth. We probably need to renew that training again. It's a it, it, it's one of those things you just have to persist and persist and persist. We've been working on programs there for 13 years, and so there's I think better knowledge among staff that these things exist. There's people you can get advice from. There's training materials, et cetera. Um, we have a question. Um, we had an individual that is blind and hearing impaired with severe disabilities going to a Peoria hospital, and they would not let us 
in to assist with him. Do you know if Illinois will be changing this so we can get in? Uh, I, I don't. But there are, are the statements from the Office of Civil Rights and the Federal Department of Human Services that hospitals should not be doing this. They might call the Office of Civil Rights. or um, equip, because it's federal policy. Um, Certainly, kind of in this contact oh, information. Okay. Glad to send you this, the statements that came from Rush. I know that uh, these days, Lutheran has a clear statement. There's others. And, and there is a statement from the Office of Civil Rights, but no, I don't know what if the Illinois Department of Public Health. Yeah, is. Sarah, if you can send anything, we will post uh, along with the webinar so um, everyone can have access to it. Sure. And another question in the ADA, does reasonable accommodations include the hospital providing a sitter for person with uh, intellectual developmental dis disabilities is there in need, especially since the caregiver usually doesn't get paid while the person is in the hospital. Well, that's probably a more difficult question. Um, people are entitled to reasonable accommodation. And larger institutions, what becomes reasonable is more so than what's true for a small. Uh, I know that there will be a lot of pushback on sitters because they're expensive. Again, I'd probably say you might want to contact someone like Equip for Equality, like I'm getting like uh, that. If the person really needs it, they need it. And that hospital should be giving you like a it, I would put it in that language. This is a reasonable accommodation. How do you recommend handling communication and impairments for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities while hospitalized? Well, that of course depends on the person. The, the nursing care plan that we have in the electronic medical record gives some directions on how to assess what's the level of receptive communication and expressive communication. So it could be, could be using very simple language. Some people may use communication boards. Some people um, would respond to gestures or showing things visually. I would certainly say no matter whether the person is visually impaired, hearing impaired, you should always introduce yourself when you come in a room because especially if somebody's hearing impaired, they can see you. You come in, act like you're introducing yourself, say something, whatever. Don't just come in and start pulling bed sheets back and sticking in tubes and so forth. And that's a big problem in hospital. It just is. Terrible, but it, it violates what I was taught in nursing school, but I see it happen. Another, I know we have a group called Neurodiversity Allies. It's a student volunteer group at Rush, and they'll complain that the attending physician comes in with four or five uh, residents and students behind them, and all of a sudden, you know, people, the person's becoming very anxious. They're just not used to that many people coming in, staring at them and pulling sheets and whatever. And that's that communicates a lot of bad stuff, actually. But of course, it, it is an individual assessment how the person communicates. But in, in general, there are things like culture of respect. You introduce yourself. You ask if it's okay if I can bring these people in the room before you do so. Um, you treat the person like a person and not just whatever the diagnosis is. 
or whatever equipment they've got going on. And that's probably one of the hardest things is to build that culture. Does that make sense? So in, in the same sort of vein um, with, with the past question, has there been an emphasis that new doctors, those, those that are just entering the field, are trained to better, better address the needs of those who, are, who have intellectual disabilities? Um, at, at least you can speak to what Brush has been doing with that. Well, there was just a group of medical students who surveyed their colleagues, their, their fellow students who said they really didn't get any training and work, didn't know much. So I know we have a whole meeting coming up, actually this week, on the, the issue that <clears throat> across the board, healthcare professional programs, it's the exception where there is a concerted effort to do any training. The Lenovo, I know, uh, has had uh, content integrated again across the nursing curriculum for about 10 years. At our college and the College of Nursing, in the curriculum, not much, uh, because we use about four sites that serve people with intellectual disabilities as clinical sites. I'd say probably at least a third of our students would have had a clinical experience. And for those of you who might be in community-based agencies, clinical sites are so hard to get right now in the middle of COVID. And of course, it's not necessarily a time you want students to be coming in, but that people are looking for sites. We are, um, I'm working with some faculty there to, to look at uh, having interprofessional groups of students do telehealth visits, and that would be uh, in community-based agencies also. Um, if you were to go to an ER with a person with intellectual and developmental disability, besides calling your primary MD first, what should you say to inform the ER staff right away? I would let them know right away that the person has an intellectual disability. And if there are particular issues in regard to communication and things that might be frightening to the person, tell them right away. And of course, you really should have the basic health information with you. What are the medications? What are, what conditions somebody already may have? Do they have diabetes, high blood pressure, whatever those things? What, what are the meds, any allergies? Those are also important in an, in an immediate situation. So the, the, I gave the, a link to a health, it's called a health resume, that uh, this, our attempts to get uh, recommended by Department of Human Services in Illinois. But it's a two-page document that has, it's fillable and you can put that kind of information in. And there are other ones around, but, but people, you know, it is true that going in with a big binder from an agency is almost useless. They don't have, they don't have the time to look through it. They want to know that information up front. Um, how do you make sure that individuals that need communication boards have access to them? <laughs> Again, accommodation issue. Hopefully the institution would have some available or you can bring in one from home. But if, they, if somebody needs a communication board, just like they need a, a, a sign language interpreter or they need a Spanish interpreter, they should be able to use it. And I have heard stories of people being told that they, they don't provide sign language interpreters in the emergency departments and so forth, that is against also federal policy. It's just like having Spanish language or German language or whatever. It's, it's an interpretive sense, interpretation service. And also 
people are allowed to have support, you know, support animals in the hospital. If you have a service dog or whatever, it's federal. They have to allow that animal in. And I think we were one of the early ones to have a policy on uh, on service animals that included things that, but yes, you're entitled to it and setting up some standards of how you do things for relief for the animal and so forth. Hospitals should have clear policies on that. Um, can you comment about LEND programs for training of healthcare professionals? And for um, the audience that doesn't know what LEND programs are, it's the Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities. Well, actually, you're probably better qualified to comment on it. I, I know UIC has one. US, Rush is involved with it, but I'm not involved with the LEND program directly. So I'm not as familiar as you might be. Or Beth, if she's on me. I'm checking with Beth to, for her to say something uh, about LEND programs at UIC. Um, some group homes do not send individuals to the hospital with eyeglasses or hearing aids for fear of their devices being lost. What is your opinion on this practice? Uh, I, I get why you wouldn't, because I would, uh, that, that happened, not just to people with intellectual disabilities. Um, it's certainly not, it doesn't speak well to the institution if these things get lost, and hearing aids in particular are very expensive. So, I, I, I mean, I get why people would do it to, in order to protect their clients from losing these devices. You know, obviously it's better to have a hearing aid. It's better for them to have the support person there who can make sure that the hearing aid is in place and that nobody walks off with it or doesn't get left in the food tray or something like that, thrown out. Beth, do you want to respond about LEND programs? I'll unmute you. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes. Do you want to just yeah. say hi, introduce yourself? <laughs> hi, I'm, I'm Beth Marks. I work with Yasmina in the Health Matters Program. Welcome, everyone. Um, there are 52 LEND programs um, in 44 of the states across the U.S. Um, many times the LEND programs are connected with uh, the Centers on Excellence, what are called UFSEC, University Centers on Excellence for uh, Developmental Disabilities, but not all, not all um, universities have a LEND and a UFSEC, but many do. In terms of training um, over, the, over the years, we, we still do train healthcare professionals. Um, it, what, what used to be, take place in the old university affiliated program, which started out of the Kennedy era of um, back in 1963. They were typically connected with children's hospitals. They're not necessarily a lot of the lens as things have evolved over the decade. Um, they're not so, what, what I would say, medical model approach. They're more lens that are talking Training, providing training around um, advocacy and legal issues, which is a good thing. So it depends on the particular, I'm not sure um, which state you're in in regards to the question about the land, but it depends on um, your particular land and what their core disciplines are. So I think many of the lands have a, a, a at a minimum, a core discipline of medicine, but the lens have really broadened out beyond what used to be sort of the interdisciplinary team of the healthcare and specifically the hospital approach. Um, 
I would encourage everyone, regardless of what state you're in, to look up, and yes, Ming, I can um, provide this link, but it's AUCD.org. Um, that would be Apple University Cat and Dog.org. And when you get to that home page, you will see in the upper left corner, you'll see three different divisions of USAG lens and the IDDRC, which are the research arm. But it's a nice, they have a really nice map of all the USAGs across the states and territories and, and the lens program. And it's really worthwhile um, as community organization for anyone who's interested in training to connect with um, either your USAG and or your lens to see what's happening and in particular to see in regard to the training question what, what your particular training needs um, because they are federally funded so they, they do, um, as Sarah was saying, that, that whole advisory board is really important across the youth sets and the lens. So it, it's really worth calling and seeing what they're doing, making an appointment and connecting. I know over the decades that Yasmin and I have been training nationally, I can t count on one hand. Um, and I, I do have five fingers on one of my hands, so I would say there's um, maybe maybe two or three people over the years who have ever even heard of USTEC and LANG. So, so they tend to be situated in larger metropolitan areas, so getting out to more of the suburbs and the rural areas, I, I think we could really do a much better job to make sure that everyone is benefiting from the lens um, training and the advocacy work that, that's happening across the youth sets. Uh, yes, did that, that, do you think I got yes. the question? Um, do you have to be a student to participate in lens training? You know, it, it changed that over the, the years too, and it, and it goes back to your lens. I know at UIC, one of the things that we, um, at UIC, what University of Illinois at Chicago, we were sort of late in becoming a USTAG. So our USTAG and then our subsequent land program, which was funded um, not until 2008, we, we were, unlike a lot of other USTAGs that were much more hostile, children and children specific, our youth set really started out as very community oriented and very much advocacy oriented. And so for our land, um, no, we do, we, we do accept people who um, are on the advocacy side. Really good question in regards to being a healthcare professional. Can you get land training? I know certainly families. An individual with IDD, you do not have to be a student to apply, but I, I am not sure about um, being a healthcare professional, and I'm, I'm happy to follow up on that question if you want to um, contact me off, off the call. Um, I'm, I'm happy to ask, ask that question and get an answer because it's really a good question. Actually, I, if you can clarify, um, whether you mean specifically a healthcare professional, I, I'd love to know that too. And I have posted the LEND uh, link for, through Association of University Centers and Disabilities, which is AUCD, so to all participants. Um, thank you, Beth. Um, Sarah, can you, oh, um, to clarify about LEND, I was asking as a healthcare professional, but on administrative side. Okay, I'm I'm trying to get that answer right now. So okay, hopefully thanks. Hopefully, I can find out. Um, Sarah, can you provide a few examples? Oops, my my question ran away. Um, of ways that support persons help people with physical or sensory disabilities while in the hospital. So most examples in state or federal guidelines have focused on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, just communication needs, de-escalation strategies, et cetera. 
Um, well, certainly those are two issues, the communication needs and the de-escalation strategy. Um, certainly, the, if the person uh, may communicate through a communication board, I would say not a whole lot of healthcare professionals know what those are or how to use them. They more should you know it, but these are something that the support person typically would know. Um, they may have their own, you know, because people communicate in a variety of ways. They may, they may communicate by smiling or nodding their head or, or other gestures that the support person is familiar with and can help to facilitate communication between the person and the and the healthcare uh, providers. Certainly, the de escalation, like the person. The, care, the support person may know things like the light should be low in the room. We should be in a, as much as possible, a low noise environment. Uh, you shouldn't have an attending with five residents coming into the room at one time. Things of this sort that they can help to uh, protect the person uh, with those kinds of things and, and make it clear to the providers that there are some sensory and behavioral needs needs for managing their own behaviors in the sense that that make that are that that place should be providing and not provoking anxiety. Um, and then of course things like, you know, does the person just because the person's now got an IV in and maybe a uh Foley catheter and so forth, it doesn't mean the person was incontinent before they got there. So advocating for things like let's get that Foley out if it's no longer needed or making sure that the person like others like needs to get up and move once that's possible. That they because they're more familiar with the capabilities of the person baseline than the providers would be and advocating for things of that sort. A lot of it's an advocacy role to me. You know, they're the ones who know the person best, and these are things that the person probably can do once you, you know, once you get through a certain phase of treatment. Yes, they should be up and moving. Yes, they should be being taken to the bathroom. Don't just assume they're incontinent. Don't just assume they were non non mobile, not mobile ahead of beforehand. Don't just assume they couldn't eat. Uh, You know, they may have been on a soft diet, but don't assume they now need a G tube just because you think they did. I mean, these things go on all the time where healthcare providers assume they often assume a lower functionality than actually exists. Sarah, do you want to talk about your Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Committee at Rush and the goals and objectives of the committee? Uh, yes, we have one. Um, it's been around since 2007. Our, um, our general goal was to improve uh, hospitalization services and experience. Um, You know, early period was, we did a lot of, we did a, sort of a needs assessment. We did we did a it, survey among staff what they thought their needs were. Um, and we did surveys out in the community about their experiences. So things like that staff said at that time, they, some of the, their key issues were they didn't know how to assess pain very well, for instance, that communication was a big issue. Um, they didn't, they, they were not comfortable with things like addressing sensory needs and behaviors. Uh, <laughs> from the community, we got a lot of very fairly harsh statements about what happens. Um, so once we had those things, we then we developed some targeted education programs on them. And we, we did a whole series on addressing sensory needs in the first couple of years. We also had, I remember having a program on pain assessment. Um, we did a couple of programs on 
legal issues around guardianship, all that uh, powers of attorney, those kinds of things, what you had to do. It was, it's interesting when we did chart reviews, we, we well, early on we did what, what the Joint Commission, if they come in and visit, they will trace a person through the hospital and look for breakdowns in care and communication. So we developed tracers uh, early also, probably six, seven years ago, to trace persons with intellectual disabilities through the hospital. And the only, I remember the only place that we could find consistently where their guardianship was noted was in the operating room. They have to have it legal. Otherwise, you couldn't find it. You, you could, it was hard to find anywhere in the chart, whether it was charted at all. Um, certainly transitions from one unit to another emergency department to a unit, operating room to a unit were problematic. That's not just for this population, but those were po problematic areas of handoff. Which is part of our reason why we have an ongoing pro pro right now to we're working in the emergency department, but better charting and communication uh, on that on the issues. So, so we did do a needs assessment. We developed programming based on the needs assessment. We did some further needs assessment about a year ago that while people sort of knew that up on some of the units, they knew that there was supposed to be something in the electronic record. They knew there was some training available. They didn't know where to find it. Um, some of the barriers, like it takes a longer time, to, they feel sometimes to use these materials. So we do kind of an ongoing needs assessment and try to target the to what we find. Uh, currently, like I said, right now we're working on a project, a new project that involves better, uh, the better charting of the issues from the emergency department in particular. And that's partly because we had students and staff who were willing to have a project. And we did just release this documentary that came out in May. So that's also, we're trying to work on that internally so that there's better knowledge around that these services exist. Sarah, do you, uh, do you consult with other institutions? And mm -hmm. um, um, how would you go about setting up similar processes across other institutions or other hospitals? Uh, we do. Uh, three years ago, we had a conference at Rush called Partnering to Transform Healthcare with Persons with Disabilities. And particularly since then, there's been an com ongoing committee looking at hospitalization practices that, uh, of course, we haven't really done much meetings during COVID, but we were typically meeting about every three months. And so there were people from across the country in different hospitals. Uh, like I said, I, we know of three places that had fairly consistent tailored programs on the inpatient side, some on the outpatient. Um, I'd say probably one of the first things is get a committee together. You have to, you, you, you need to have, if, at best, if you can get across disciplines and a few, at least a few people who are in positions where they can make decisions. That was true of our committee at Ru when we started in 2007. We had uh, we had nurses, physicians, social workers, at least one doctor, and we had a couple, at least a couple people who were in a position that they could make some decision, make something happen. And we went consciously went after the, the people in that those positions to try to get to try to get buy-in from administration. But you really need, and similarly, we've had an ADA committee at Rush since 1991, and it's and it has representation from across the institution, including people who are, have a, some authority. And so, that, I think that's part of the reason why the visitor policy was almost a non-issue for us. It was fit very well into what we'd already been doing. Uh, 
Um, how are you working with, how is Rush working with community organizations in terms of bringing people into the hospital and then returning them to group homes? Is there any coordination? I'm uh, working on a grant about that. <laughs> I would say, yeah, there is. I wouldn't say it was the best. I, I still think, although we've had some improvements because we've run education on that as well, that if you talk to staff in hospitals, they think group homes are like nursing homes. You know, you can discharge somebody in the middle of the night. There's somebody there who understands all the gibberish you might write on a discharge plan and so forth. They don't understand what the environment is that people are going to. And that's something, too, that our, when talking with people in the community, they complain that the, the, the health care providers don't know, they don't know their community in the sense. They don't understand the kinds of settings they live in. They don't understand how much difficult it is to get transportation services, all these things. They don't, they don't know what, what, where people are being discharged to or if they're getting out of patient care, the place where they live. We are working on a grant about that right now. It sounds like a lot of things haven't changed in since 07. <laughs> Yeah, there yeah. some things have changed and other things haven't. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We did get better uh, cuts, so we got enough to do that, and that's helped us with internal buy-in. Well, I wanted to thank you, Sarah, for for allowing actually question and answer um, session that was much longer. We oftentimes do not have. Um, this much time to just have free questions for the audience to just kind of um, be able to like think through some of these pieces. Um, if you have any other questions for Sarah or Beth, please uh, put them in the chat box. Um, other than that, I just wanted to announce our next week's August 4th uh, webinar um, on Virtual Health Matters Program Coach, Health Matters Now More Than Ever. I'm very excited about this because I will be actually presenting instead of ho and hosting, so bear with me next week. Um, and we will be talking about how we took one of our evidence-based health promotion programs and are um, transferring it into a virtual sort of programming. We are working with a couple of um, community organizations and one of the organizations, Aspire, who is also a partner in these webinars, Kristen Kroc will be co-presenting with me. She will be talking about uh, lessons learned, how it's going in sort of two formats on how they approach this uh, virtual coaching for health promotion in, within the homes, within the group homes or community homes. So um, I've posted the registration link if you have interest to um, um, attend next week. Um, again, thank you again, Sarah, and thank you for attending today. Uh, we will stick around for a few more minutes to see if there are any other questions. Other than that, uh, we have recorded the webinar. We will provide everything, including I was getting some PDFs and some other resources throughout the webinar, so I will compile them and we will post them under resources uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to access um, everything that Sarah has talked about in some of the presenters. Um, thank you again. And Sarah, let's just stick around for a couple of minutes and see if there are any other questions. And have a great rest of the day. So I was going to say that I do have material that if you want on some of these programs, specific programs like the care plans, we have some materials on the training with the security department, the, what I call Absolutely. the Absolutely. I have those materials. If you email me, I'll be glad to send them to you. Okay. Yeah. I will email and then we can post them on the, uh, on the uh, webinar link. That would be perfect. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Looks like there's no more questions, so I will end the webinar. Thank you again. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Deb, for captioning. Bye. Bye.